Everybody, it's the Jess Plus Scott Plus You Show. Welcome. We are so excited to have you here with us, and I am excited. I'm at well, I'm always excited, but this is really special because every once in a while, my mom does something co completely and utterly amazing, and I just have to show you. Okay, what does what does this say? What does it say? Can you read it? Awesome. It says awesome. Look what they are. They're socks. I have a pair of awesome socks. Now, never thought socks could be so cool. I now have some of the coolest socks on the planet. And I recommend these for everybody. Or maybe a sticker that says, I am amazing, or I am awesome, or I am, I am. That could be what the sticker says. Because choice starts with you. Choice starts with you. And affirmations work, and whatever meditation or breath work that you guys may choose to do, what it comes down to, regardless of how quirky or creative, is that we have a choice. And part of our choice is to see. So how are you doing tonight, Scott? Well, I'm doing really well. And uh, how, how are you today? Holy macaroni, day one of four days of jury duty was all right. <laughs> I made it through a totally different use of my brain, and I get to go back more this week. So, ha, that was what's going on in my world today. How about you? Well, you know, it was a, it was a day that started off with uh, the Lunch Bunch with Ray, Ray Hilton. That was a lot of fun and got a, just a lot of things that needed to get finished. And um, I also thought a little bit about uh, going into the stratosphere. Shall I do that right now? Let's go. Okay, because uh, part of the part of the discussion that we're having uh, today is choices, and you know, this will be this will be kind of a short uh, stratosphere. But the relationship between meditation and the choices that you make, because really at the end of the day, it's not as if you don't make choices. It's that you always come up to a fork in the road, and you're either going to take the right one or the left one. I can remember, and I've never told anyone this, so our audience gets to hear this for the first time. I was young, uh, in college, not really doing everything that I wanted to, and I hadn't written to my parents in like a, a month and a half. It was way due, past due, and I thought, oh, what can I do to make up? So I called them up, and I said, and this was a choice that I made, I've decided to move to, from my hometown Billings down to where they lived, Reno. And you know the reason for that choice? It was because I hadn't written to them in such a long time. I wanted to kind of have some big news for them. What a huge difference that would make in a person's life. When, you, when one meditates, when one clears one's mind, then other things arise. And once that happens, if you don't have the observations of the mind cluttering it up, then you have an opportunity to make better choices. At least that's the thesis or the theme that I am putting forward for tonight. So there. <laughs> All right. And as people catch up with that, George, we want to say hello and welcome to you. Welcome to you. And I guess I'm in a singing mode. So do you sing, George? Why, yes, I do. Welcome to you. <laughs> Yay! Oh, I like it. You, you know, everybody, George just steps up and steps in, and he is fantastic. We I just threw started. down with the crooner just then. That was the croon. A croon. I don't know what a croon is. You're going to oh. have to be that. <laughs> well, right along. Moving right along. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> One of those. Okay. Got it. <laughs> We've been so looking forward to uh, George joining us in the film strip because if anyone can engage in a very deep and thoughtful conversation, it is Mr. Green with us. Um, you just appeared out of nowhere. Um, uh, we were going along, and then all of a sudden, George Green comes, you know, you, you, you appeared in the comment streams, and you have your own programs, and, and um, just all sorts of things. So it's really nice having you uh, with us today, and I can hardly wait to hear what you have to say and how, how you can add to the, uh, to the discussion. Thank you, Scott. Um, well, and we're talking about choosing to know, and knowing for me is certainty. So 
the reason I just showed up was I was following all the experts' advice on Google+, Plus, which was build rapport, build engagement, build your audience. And, I, you know, I had a, my own TV show about five or six years ago on live stream. I had two sessions, so I was really chomping at the bit to have a show, but I reined that enthusiasm in because I choose to know when the good time is to start. And because I just showed up, I was prepared. I was ready and enthusiastic. And here we are having some essential conversations. Sounds good. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break and say thank you for joining us with the Jess Plus Scott Plus You Show. We are talking about Choose to Know, and we have with us our guest, George Green. So, George, let's go back to the question that Scott set up for us. Where would you like to go with that? Is that me or Scott? You, George. Ah, okay. So, <clears throat> the first couple of questions we really want to pose, one to ourselves, but especially to our friends in the audience, are these. What are the answers you're searching for? And what direction is next for you? Cool. And you know that ties right into meditation and the power of, of meditation, but it doesn't necessarily end or start there. And I think that when we are thinking about those questions, at least for me, that requires a, a little bit of, of quiet, a quiet of the mind, because we have to get something more connected to ourselves, more connected to the universe to allow that to start to come out. Indeed, uh, the, the, the context of what we're talking about is, is moving into knowing the unknown or answering, getting answers to questions we don't have answers to yet. And um, quite often when you ask a pointed question like, what's next for you? The first thing that comes out of many people's mouths is, I don't know. And so right away that's a consciousness, a mindset, and a form of language that refers that person being immersed in not knowing rather than being immersed in the question and curiosity. That's where I choose to know comes from. So when we think about that, what direction is next for you? And we say, I don't know. What are some things that we can do or think about to shift that and create the pathway or open the door to some sort of flow? Well, first and foremost, pause. Uh, I do not know is a reaction, a knee-jerk reaction to the, un the discomfort of not knowing or being in some sort of inner argument about what the answer is because many of us are, are other than aware but we have active within our unconscious mind a myriad of what I call inner arguments or oppositions uh, especially when we are stretching forward into our vision uh, when we're completing some big cycle of our life that's a very current uh, uh, space for a lot of people are in where they're transitioning from one kind of life or one kind of job into a brighter future or a different future and everything's unfamiliar so my answer would be first and foremost when you're in the question wait don't try to answer it right away allow that question to be what I call the empty cup <clears throat> there's a great illustration for this who in the audience here has ever lost their keys and you're asking yourself where did I leave my keys? And you're asking a consciousness that doesn't remember where they are. It doesn't have the answer. And that's usually why we search the same junk drawer four or five times. Uh, who has lost their reading glasses and looked throughout the entire house and then touched their forehead and there they were? So, the, you know, the, the, the jump here, the, the reaction is to use a consciousness that other than knows yet to answer the question that's at hand. 
Scott, you look like you're jumping to say something. Oh, man. I mean, you're just opening up such wonderful things. The <laughs> underlying assumption, and, and tell me if this is correct, George, the underlying assumption is that if, on, if it weren't for the fact that we, if, if only we could calm our mind and wait, be that empty cup, that eventually the right answer will come to us. Mm-hmm. Is it? And, well, and, and it's, it, uh, I'm, I'm trained in conscious language, so with permission, I'm going to invite an upgrade from if only to just simply when we choose to slow down and so em- that, leave the cup empty. That even strengthens my question, because how do, how do you know that just by the mere nature of my slowing down, that the right answer will inevitably percolate? Why, why not the wrong answer? Why not something that would send me down the wrong path, you know, to hell in a handbasket? Hmm. All right, so your question is born out of uncertainty. Your question no. may, may be born out of a history of not being sure about your choices. Uh, the answer is practice. How, how do I operate from certainty when I ask and, and I say ch- I choose to know? is because with practice I have learned how to implicitly trust my inner intuition, my inner voice, my heart to the point where I, it's implicit as I said just a second ago. Uh, so when I ask the question and when I've practiced slowing down the machinations of trying to answer it, this is, this is a function of imagination and curiosity and a hunger to be inspired. Inspiration often we think is a lightning bolt from uh, heaven, but it actually is an explosion of imagination, creation, and a desire to know that has its origins in our heart, in our center. And we've gotten so good at listening to a critic or thinking about how whatever we do might be too different and we work towards a common center, I call it the sea of sameness, then living on the fringe and knowing that the fringe is where each and every single one of us is supposed to be. I mean, holy cow, there's the Milky Way in the sky, yet there are still many other galaxies out there that we can see and many other stars beyond that. And without that, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be made of the stars if that wasn't occurring. Now, I was thinking about a little bit more of, of the question, too, because when we don't listen to our voice, or we're not sure, going back to the critic or the self-doubt or whatever it is, that quietness, sometimes we can listen too long. It's like that, um, and, and we never act. So there are the people that plan to act, and they may know in their heart of hearts what the answer is, but something has not sparked they're going forward. So when I am one of those people where I'm planning and planning and planning and I have a, I've been able to quiet my mind or whatever form I use to open myself up to receive the answer, yet there's still a little bit of hesitation. We're still, what I hear you saying is we're still working from this place of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. So do you have a practice or a thought that when we know, we know, we choose to know, now we actually, we have to light a fire under our butts or get on our magic carpets or ride our unicorns or whatever we're going to do. How do we find the courage to do that in your, in, in your frame of reference, in your worldview? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And the how is quite often how we get hung up in staying in a question rather than taking action. And operating from certain, let's talk from the space of a vision. Um, and, and whatever your vision is, the more you associate into the texture and the detail and the specificity of your vision, the clearer your outcome becomes. And to, a, to the degree, and, and a lot of visionaries and creators and artists uh, play in this particular playground, to the degree that they are operating from already having their vision fulfilled. That's a level of certainty that we can describe. Another level <clears throat> of certainty is a reflection of your commitment to your vision, your commitment to not only 
the large big picture, uh, the, the picture out on the horizon, but your commitment to what the next best step forward is. And and so there are, there are two metrics there. Keep your eye on the prize and mm, mm, <laughs> keep your eye on the prize and keep your strategy and refine your strategy on your trajectory. Where am I today? on my trajectory to my own fulfillment and that is a question I go through every day because I'm the guy who likes a bigger fire so I can put more irons in it so if I'm not in that inner inquiry of what's the most generative thing I should be doing or can do just now um, and, and that changes from moment to moment so for me that practice of certainty happens moment to moment, day to day, hour to hour. Um, I'm, I hope uh, that answered your question. It does, and here's what I got out of that. You're going to see one of my beautiful drawings here, and it'll probably show up in a picture somewhere. So I saw a bar graph, right? I nice. see keep your eye on the prize on one axis, and I see my trajectory for my life on the other, and then I have a bell curve. Mm -hmm. I, I, think it's a, I actually think it's more of a bell curve than it is a straight line or an exponential growth specifically because if we don't keep our eye on the prize enough we're not going to find and stay on our trajectory but if we keep our eyes too much on our trajectory or too much on our prize we're also off course so I feel it feels like one of those bell curves well and, and in oh, reality it may actually look like a Jackson Pollock painting oh well that's true Wow. Too. Well, I'm just saying, I'm, I was not looking about all the pieces. I was literally trying to focus it down to those two things. And there's going to be some special balance to get the eye on the prize and the trajectory at the same place mm -hmm. to launch forward. Yeah, it always comes down to feeling. Choosing to know is a feeling of expectation and curiosity. Operating from certainty is a feeling of this is it, I'm on it, I'm on my path, and I'm burning it up right now. Now, how many people have a taste of that? The invitation here in our conversation today is cultivate it. Don't wait for it to show up in some serendipitous moment. Have a hunger and a desire for certainty, and allow that to affect your commitments to play all in and to draw and and your original question was how do we call up our courage do it that's right at some point action is necessary off the bench onto the game that's right and that action could be standing up that action could be like I know there's somebody in my life is like this they are really scared about certain things so actually driving to the place they need to go but not going through the door is a huge step. Actually doing a search and making a choice to call for a service provider but not being able to actually pick up the phone and dial yet, huge action. So we're not when we're talking about this stuff, we are not talking about, ooh, it's going to come out of us and we have to take big action. We're talking about the teeniest, tiniest baby steps because baby one steps. of the cool things about fuel or when you know when you shoot off a firework or something like that is there's that fuse and the closer the fuse gets the more um, oh, what is the word I'm looking for inevitable the explosion is <laughs> there we go Nice. <laughs> okay we have a couple of quotes that I'd like to share the first is from Phil Boyer he says the direction that's next forward towards my destination the answers I'm seeking are those that get me to my destination. We also have another one from David Stevens. For many people, the quiet is unnerving. They really need someone to converse with in order to bring out their answers. And I have to say, I completely agree with that. Even if you're primary, even if you're primarily visual, even if you're primary, primarily a thinker or a planner, once the conversation starts, it's pretty amazing, which is which is probably one reason I talk to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, the important piece here is, and leads us into enrolling people in 
you know, you can make a career out of chasing your own tail by asking yourself those questions. Uh, this is the great value in having a mentor or a coach. Now, I've been I've been doing that for other people for upwards of thirty years. I need one. I need a mentor. I need somebody that I can sound off on, who can hold me accountable, who can point out when uh, I'm filtering something rather than really being present to what is. So uh, I think there's great value in that. Uh, there, there's been an ongoing conversation that seems to be uh, branching out where people like us and our friends are having conversations around waking up and moving into new levels of partnership. Uh, first within ourselves, the new partnership is listening, Re renewing and resurrecting your conversation with your essential self, with your heart, with uh, what you burn for, what's passionate in you. That's scary. And, it is scary. And I love scaring myself, you know, so let's, uh, let's all get together and pin our ears back. Let's, you know what, I think that what you just said is incredibly pivotal, pit, oh wow, pivotal to our conversation in the sense that if we are not scared, we are not in a place of growth. If we are not scared, we're sitting around in our comfortable chair. We're we're taking it easy. We're we're living in a place of existence. It's not it's not subtractive. It's not like we're we're missing anything in our lives, but it's just kind of this goes back to the sea of sameness versus being additive versus living in this type of richness that is available just by those tiny incremental steps of being scared and living in that gray area of growth. I'm going to paraphrase, but one of my great uh, um, quotes I hinge on is from Simone de Beauvoir, who was um, Jean Sartre's uh, partner and beloved, and she characterized what you just talked about, which is living in our comfort, comfort zones mm -hmm. to only not dying. Right. And the reality is, and I think the discomfort that so many of us are feeling, and the, the seemingly spontaneous transitions that are happening that are making us uncomfortable, is the reality that we are being called up and out to wake up, to step out of our familiar zones, out of our comfort zones, and really throw down and remember and choose to know why we're here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between, and in the past, only not dying or surviving or just going along at whatever your, you know, your autopilot settings was doable and sustainable. It's not anymore. That's true. We have a new, we have a new status quo. I think that came up today actually on Ray's show where what our expectations of or what we aspired to be or what our baseline for existence was 20 years ago is very different than what it is today. So we have to show up at this other place and then be ready to continue to launch from there. Now how does this, I, I'm going to totally take a turn and I want to talk about this in the form of leadership. And I want to talk about this in the form of leadership because whether we are a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, a single person in business, or we are part of a 500 or a thousand person organization, we might head a team, we might answer the phones, we might sweep the floors, we might be setting the strategy. All of this comes down to active leadership. And there are three areas of active leadership. The first is the self, the second is the task that needs to be done, and the third is the team. And where each of those overlap is that sweet spot. And it's really cool to think about everything that we were talking about for the individual, for the self, and then knowing, basically setting an example. Leaders are example setters. They they get people to follow them and buy in because they're walking their walk. They're doing what needs to be done and they're doing it in a caring way that is truly connected to the other people around them and the organization's mission for which they choose to work or spend their time. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming more and more obvious in organizations that that doesn't happen, including solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, and small businesses, as well as those 
as some people, and I'm going to totally paraphrase here, say those greedy bastards in those really big organizations. I mean, honestly and truly, we could have that same mentality that people perceive only being in big, large organizations actually appearing in the tiniest organizations. And with this change of huge organizations being balanced out by more and more tiny organizations, one person, two person, 10 people, 20 people, so less than 50. We've got this place where these guys down here, we can actually do a shift as small business owners. Just like a corporation, a large organization can do a shift. Now, it takes a lot more energy to turn the ship of a huge organization. Whereas, can you imagine a ton of tiny ships? changing at the same time. It makes me think of a flock of butterflies, right, compared to an airplane. <laughs> if every single person that worked for an organization of 50 people or less took the time to actively think about what we're talking about tonight and answering some questions in that frame of self, in that frame of team, which even if you're one, you have a team, which is a question and a thought process just in itself, and then the tasks that are being done, the mission and the vision, what are you doing to serve the world around you? What is lighting you up to do the work that you're doing? We can all be flying in this direction to go and be supported by each other in this crazy place. So I just totally expanded, pin your ears back right there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a detailed and wonderful uh, description and agreement. I love it. I love the idea that we can, no matter how big we are, no matter what role we play in the organization that we're in, that there's us and there's the organization. And we really have something additive to it. And we are typically are not our organization. And even people who work in big organizations, if they become their organization to an extent, they take things a little more personally. They're not able to see the team. They're not able to see the mission or serve the way that they need to serve. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about stuff like that, I am talking about everybody regardless of business size in that sense, which I think is kind of cool that we all have an ownership and an onus to think about that stuff. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, and it goes to also, I mean, you, you talk about con, uh, complex monolithic structures like large corporations or midsize, and the complexity never it goes away. It just changes in scope all the way down to a solopreneur. But essentially, back to I choose to know and listening and slowing down, the key to your success, the key to your having a, a, an ideation, a vision, and then fleshing that out with breath and love and life, uh, making it real, has everything to do with being aware of, choosing to know where you are internally with your inner agreements and alignments as opposed to your inner arguments. And the reality is, is most of those inner arguments, the doubts, the fears, uh, the a parent's voice that we've adopted as our own that says you're not good enough or you're you're doing it wrong any number of things they're active and they're echoing beneath our conscious awareness so if you have a vision if you have a desire and a dream then ask yourself I choose to know what part of me is fully aligned and committed and I choose to know and I choose to sit with those parts of me who are not. That is essentially the pillar of mindfulness and the mindfulness practice, which is curiosity. I choose to know. And that curiosity, there is no wrong answer. That curiosity, every answer, I'm going to say it differently, every answer is correct. Because it aligns with us as individuals, you, me, George, Scott, in that moment. We're not the same people we were 10 years ago, and we're not going to be the same people in 10 years. So when we think about curiosity, that's something that's really important. It, curiosity is a way to live in the moment. It is a way to bring in what is truth right now. Mm -hmm. It's very uncomplicated. And the invitation that I uh, make to my client partners and my friends, because we're all playing on the same playground, which is step off the old battlefield and onto your new playground, and to just to expand on curiosity is we choose to sit with what is active in any moment outside of judgment or narrative that's what's active unconsciously 
So what Jess said was there is no wrong answer. The reality is we don't even deal in right and wrong, just what is active. It's really clear in a mindfulness practice or your practice to choosing to know, if you want to know if it's a good direction, notice I said good rather than right or wrong, then if it's in alignment with your true purpose or your heart, it's going to feel fiery and expansive and exciting. And if it's not, it will feel heavy and contractive. And that may seem like a, 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 an oversimplification. It's not. Because no, it in is the, not. Because in, in the moment, you choose to know. And there is no debate. There is no argument. You either are on or you're not. And you sit with your knots and you love them just as you do your enthusiasm. Because what was operating in your unconscious awareness when it's brought into the light of your conscious awareness, it no longer has the ability to rule you or drive you in a particular direction or create, again, inner chaos, confusion, or uh, conflict. This is the Just Plus Scott Plus You Show. We are talking with George Green about I Choose to Know. So thank you, George Green, for that amazing answer. And, you know, Scott, you've been, a, you've been absorbing a lot. What's going on in that brain of yours? Well, I'm, list, I'm listening to George, and I'm thinking about people who might just be going along living life because you live life. You, you grow up, you've got a mortgage, you have families and so forth, and then at some point you kind of wake up and you think, okay, I want to take things to the next step. What, uh, how, long, how long does it take someone to feel as if they've been able to identify a, a new way, Let, let's say someone is out there and they say, okay, you know, I, I might be all right where I am right now, but I'd really like to take things to the next level. How long does it take and what do they have to do? The can length. I answer? Can I answer? <laughs> Please. Can I, can I, can I, can I? It could be right now. Oh, wait, no, it could be right now. Oh, wait, no, we just got that moment. We could be right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now, sorry. Thank you, George. Not sorry. Thank you, George. I needed to get that out. <laughs> I'm so glad you did, because that blew my hair back. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, wait. It just blew my hair back again. Just then. <laughs> so how long has everything to do, the, your length of time between where you are, point A and point B, point B being, you know, the next summit that you desire to reach, that outcome of the next summit is commensurate to your desire to stretch beyond your existing limits, to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, because as we've said earlier, if your dreams are not scaring you, you're not doing it right. And I know that's language steeped in right and wrong, but it's kind of fun and it's kind of funny. So how deep is your desire to change your story? Because I know, you know, uh, the way you uh, uh, um, described it, that's so many people's lives, Scott, it, it, it is the mortgage, the kids, the responsibilities, uh, the fact that I'm putting in 10 hours a day, and then I have to come home and be do my other job, all of these things. So we can have a narrative that says, this is it, this is as good as it gets, or we can say, you know, I'm busting out right now, and I... I choose to know what can be different in my life and then go after it. Okay, now here's a comment that I'd like to share from Trina Paulus. I think of the grail search. The knights sought the answer for peace was finding the grail, but they did not ask the necessary question of the wounded fisher king, what ails thee? They did not realize that question was prior and necessary for finding the answer. They missed this because they thought they knew the question and the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great one. You know, uh, what I call weeding the garden are all the reasons, conscious and unconscious, that we entertain, that we cultivate, that we have unconscious consent to that says the summit is unreachable. And so I live in a world of possibility. I always have. I never grew up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. And my belief is anything is possible. And I get up every morning and put the wizard hat on. 
Um, I am tenacious and stubborn, and when I uh, when I encounter limit or my own shadow, I don't dig in and lean forward. I sit down and slow down. Because whatever that shadow is, whatever that resistance is that I've noticed and have manifested is there because I have stretched forward beyond my fear and beyond whatever my consent was to reality this morning. So that's how we make friends with our shadow. That's how we choose to know and hold ourselves open as the empty cup. Now here's a... Here's a quote. Actually, this is a question and a comment. Is it more from Pam? Excuse me, from Pam Barraway. Is it more difficult as a team of one to take a step back and perceive the larger organizational picture? And I have to say, the answer is no. In fact, I think it's harder for large organizations because if it's if it's just me and my organization, it's me and my organization, and I might think they're one and the same. And then we've got a problem because we're going to have an identity crisis at some point. Because I am not my business, but my business is also not me. My business doesn't play with Carter. My business doesn't sweep the floors. My business doesn't go build snowmen and make snow angels. But I don't always serve my customers. I might have a team to do that. I might have some, um, you know, some partnerships to do that. I might want, you know, how I give back to the community through the through my organization is going to be different than what I do. And so I think that it's actually easier as a team of one because we get to sit in each of those circles, task, individual, and team, because I consider the organization as part of the team, especially in the tinier organizations, the small ones. And we can look at them and how they overlap together. Whereas in a bigger organization, we've got the individual, but then we've got the team. And that team might be one person, but it, in addition to the organization, but it could be 5,000 people in addition to the organization. Now, typically, organizations are broken up differently than that. So a, a large organization might have a team of 50 or a team of 20 that you would look at this, and then you might have three or four of these little diagrams for the entire organization. And the entire organization would actually need to have one of those as well. So I actually think it's harder the more people you have because every single person has a pivotal, pivotal role to play. Every single person has a reason that they're there and has a gift to bring that gets them excited that they decided to apply for the job in the first place. They decided that they wanted to come to work that day. They decided to come back from their break. They decided to come back from lunch. They left at the end of the day. They might have been tired. They might have been crazy. But they know they're going back the next day. And, and yet, those large organizations are quite often piloted by visionary leaders or visionary managers who manage to move an entire organization. Now it might be off bubble rather than some big you know showy move. So I agree with everything you said and say and in addition to that what I want to point out is our stories and expectations are what govern our results. And so if you think it's more difficult as a solar, uh, solopreneur to back away and see the larger picture, so be it. If you're invested in a large organization being more difficult to adjust trajectory, it's going to be true. There are always people who are missing the DNA that says you can't do stuff. And they just do it. And I love those people. They make me crazy sometimes. I've had some very deep relationships and personal relationships with people like that. And they challenge my freaking limits. That's why they make me crazy. But they also inspire me. Boom. Boom. <laughs> if, if Scott was saying that, he would say, so there. Oh. <laughs> 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 awesome. Well, I like I, I like the way that you that you have integrated uh, a place uh, within the large organizations as well. That uh, both of you, that individuals play uh, their role. So um, 
you know, we, we find where we are and what we have to do, but at what point do we take charge of, of the universe in which we find and, and make the differences that we choose or, or want to? And um, uh, so I think that's been part of what the discussion tonight has been about as well. And like Kate says here, we can learn a lot from the child inside us. I'll meet one, oh, excuse me, I'll meet everyone on the playground tomorrow before we work. Okay, I'm there. Count me in. <laughs> I'm in, Kate. I am yeah. in. Yeah. That's right. I love it. Well, okay, we have talked about a lot of stuff. And we have, we went in a lot of tangents. And this is, this is something like we could spend maybe five minutes on. But if we were to take each piece and we were to break it down and spend either time every day or sequentially or one a week, for several weeks, we might find some new answers about ourselves. And I'm going to repeat some of these questions that George has posed to us during the conversation and that Scott and I have contributed to or taken off on crazy tangents. And the first is, what answers are you searching for and what direction is next for you? Another, out of all your list of to-dos and your grand plans, which one of those is your actual primary? And as Scott and I would say, because we're fans of the one thing, there can only be one. And the <laughs> I am the one. I am Geo. That's right. Yes, you are. And after you figure that out, what are your best and first steps forward to creating and realizing your best possible outcome? Now, that last one we've touched on in a lot of different ways because we might look at this as ourselves in our personal life. We might look at this as a business owner. We might look at this as a leader. We might look at this as somebody going to work tomorrow or the next day. And so spend some time and think about those questions as we're moving forward. And I want to say, before we continue, where can we find you, George? Well, first and foremost, you can find me here on the Plus. Uh, and uh, I should be in the event description. Uh, I believe it's plus George Green. Uh, they can also find me on my uh, website, themindfulnessadvantage.com. Uh, and uh, I have uh, some intro programs. People, if they desire to know more, can schedule a free consultation with me. Uh, and this is more about answering questions and and presenting a potential playground and figuring out whether or not we're a good fit to play together. And that is the first guideline, is we're here to play together. Everything that you've done in the past that showed up and felt like work has created a foundation for you to play and imagine and create. And if I were to summon up my inner George Green at this moment, I would say, you are the source. Did I do a good job? I love <laughs> what do you think? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. What and, would you add to this, Scott, as we're and, winding and down the, our conversation? Different than you, Jess, what I would say is that the various topics that George has elaborated on in his various hangouts on air, and he's been, wow, he's been everywhere. They are evergreen. They are well-planned, and they will be just as relevant six months from now as they were when they, when they were live. So I yeah, encourage people to uh, check him out and to see what he has to say um, and go from there. Yay. I couldn't have said it better myself, Scott. Thank you. And I want to say, this is the Just Plus Scott Plus You Show Season 2, where we're talking about our overarching theme of the season, the supreme unselfishness and putting yourself first. We're having conversations with amazing people who are passionate about personal and business development. Grow, learn, and share your comments with us. Thank you to Scott from The Scott Treatment, who helps businesses capture the potential power of video through post-production. And I'm Jess Duell, working with business leaders that want to be so far ahead that you are setting the standard in your industry. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.